Welcome to episode 5 of the V2 Academy. I'm Chris Lappin and join me as always. I've got Peter Prickett. Good evening. Yeah. How are you doing this evening, Peter? I'm great. Yeah, so, um, shortly we'll be joined by Laurie McGinley, who is the co- um, coach at Motherwell Community Project. Um, first, we want to quickly discuss the instruction of pass in youth football. Yeah, it's a, a common complaint you'll, if you follow timelines of coaches on, on Twitter, you'll see them often talking about their parents or even other coaches shouting at kids, pass the ball, pass the ball, pass the ball. And I think that almost every coach will have a story about a time when they or someone else was shouting pass and the kid just keeps dribbling, keeps dribbling. Now, of course, that's a little bit embarrassing for the coach, but I think it's more of a problem than that. Something that we talk about is creating decision makers yeah so their players to pass the ball and play nice football they don't want them to lump it they're actually taking the decision making away and all they're doing is breeding players who receive the ball control it and pass it receive the ball control it and pass it and then they're not taking any responsibility and for me why i don't shout pass at my players especially the younger ones, is uh, I believe that dribbling is a mindset. Yeah. So if, as a young player, you were only ever told to receive it, every time you get the ball, you pass. Yeah. You don't take anyone on. And you've got to have a mentality to actually want to take people on. So as you get older, and you've always passed, yeah. to actually learn that mindset of a player's coming towards me, that's no problem, I can beat him. Rather than a player's coming towards me, I've got to shift this ball quick and give it to someone else. Conversely, we'll be able to deal with a player who's coming towards them, but also can then be coached to pass the ball later. I think it's much harder to go the other way around. So this instruction of pass, pass, pass will actually take something away from young players. And for the very youngest players, they don't want to pass the ball anyway. No. So you're, you're stunting their natural play. So we're delighted to be joined on the line by Laurie McGinley. How are you doing this evening, Laurie? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? I'm very well. So what sparked your interest in the game from a young age? Uh, from a young age, yeah. uh, I've always uh, been active in uh, all sports. Mm. I, I love football because uh, my sister was involved in football. Uh, and I liked to play it uh, when I was a, a young boy. Um, when I was uh, 10 years old, um, I became very ill. I had uh, encephalitis of the brain, uh, meningitis. Mm. And um, it took me a long time to recover. But through the kind of support of my family and friends and kind of school, um, uh, and the football team I was working with, uh, playing with, we, uh, got, uh, we decided that was going to be kind of my... Um, superior thing to kind of work with it with my confidence. Yeah. Um, I played um, really played at kind of just boys club level, and then at 18 years old, um, I got a, a letter through the, the post from the Scottish Disability uh, Football Team uh, to go and train with them because uh, I had an acquired brain, uh, brain injury, mm. uh, and um, I uh, really enjoyed the training and enjoyed the experience of actually getting to play for my country, which was a great honour. Uh, I played for them for uh, six years uh, and I just um, gave it up um, last year yeah. just to, uh, just to uh, personal reasons. Yeah, so I, I did read that you played Scotland. You got, did you finish fifth or sixth in the tournament? Was it? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, yeah. yeah so, so, uh, so what, what originally inspired you to become a coach? Um, well, when I was um, 18, 19, uh, I started doing my badges uh, at university and I like to um, basically work with uh, children and young people who didn't really have a you know, chance of kind of making it in the game 
I thought I would try and help them out because mm. uh, the people who invested in me, um, I would basically give it back to them and help them out as much as I can. Um, over the last maybe two or three years, I've been really up in my game, uh, doing my, uh, my badges, but also going on, on license courses and uh, travelling you know, up to London to do the Cuerva courses uh, and doing kind of a variety of different um, football uh, uh, courses and badges just to try and get more experience, but also meeting new people and yeah. networking. So you recently had a spell with um, Glasgow City. What was the difference between coaching teenage girls and teenage boys? Um, there's not actually much of a difference, to be honest. Um, uh, I just treat it as a, like, the when it comes to the boys and girls, I just go exactly the same and just uh, try and get the best out of them mm. uh, to uh, help them get better uh, as people and then get them better as players. Um, th- there's not much difference in the the way they play. It just maybe the the girls' games not getting as much um, coverage, but it is getting a lot more through mm. to the uh, the national team and also through you know England and Scotland and also the World Cup that happened. Uh, it was an amazing uh, watching uh, you know football because at the end of the day, football is an international sport and it doesn't matter if you have uh, you're a girl, boy, or a disability. It just it can be enjoyed and played by anyone who enjoy, uh, will to just uh, who has the whole love for the game? You're uh, you're currently at, at Motherwell, that's right. And that's is correct. It in the is it a community role? Uh, yeah, so I work with um, the community. So I work in a uh, work with young children, um, the as young as three, uh, and then I take the I help take the under 17s uh, at the moment. But I, over the the summer, uh, I got. I got to work with um, the younger ones and the kind of uh, three to fives and then the five to sevens and then the nine pluses. It was just great to have a, a variety of different children so I can use my, my skills to help uh, the other coaches out but also help the kids out uh, to help them get better at, uh, at football but also you know work together as a team more. It sounds from what you said earlier that your concern is not about any sort of elite level of, of player it's just about getting the best out of any player no matter where they're at just improve them to get as far as they can whether that becomes elite or not that's not the point the point is that they are playing they're improving and they're enjoying it yeah all, uh, I would like to one day work at elite level but right now uh, I want to work you know and help the you know people who don't have a lot you know what I mean, and help them become uh, like better people, but also just the standards. You know what I mean, like the last couple of weeks has been excellent. You know what I mean, just asking the players to come in five minutes earlier. You know what I mean, like uh, training starts at five, be in for five to five, and then we can if it's set up for them so they can be playing for the uh, uh, playing at five, and then that way they're just getting better. Like at school, turning up five minutes early. You know what I mean, or staying five minutes extra just to get out of that extra bit of work. Uh, work done and I know the elite level is very demanding and very competitive uh, with coaches and with players but at the end of the day you, the, everyone's human and they just want to get themselves uh, better at, uh, you know, at life basically and uh, get themselves better standards so they can get themselves a better, kind of better mindset so they can improve themselves just a little bit better how did you get involved with Motherwell in the first place? Uh, I, I applied for a, a position in the summer uh, and um, had a couple of uh, interviews, a uh, practical and a uh, uh, speech, and it just uh, it clicked really, really well. Uh, cause my, um, we got on really, really well, me and the, the, the two bosses that I, I work with, uh, and uh, they seen my ideas and they really liked it. So I'm really happy where I am, and it's such a good honour to be working in a football club. Is your experience working in uh, with disability has that become involved within the community work that you do, or is that something further down the line? Uh, well, I used, um, I've had to deal with uh, things um, 
with uh, children who have disabilities, but I just adapt it the best way I can. So sometimes there could be, in one session, there could be a person who might have a disability. But I'll make sure they're integrated into the session uh, as much as I can, and they are, therefore they feel they can be part of the kind of social uh, inclusion, and therefore the, the children and the, the um, adults and the coaches uh, feel comfortable about what's going on because obviously I've been students working with uh, children and adults who have got a disability but I don't think there's any difference at all. I think everyone, you just have to uh, work with everyone equally and help them the best way they can. If they need some more support, I'm happy to go in and help. I like to uh, lead the session and then let the other, if the, I'm working with another coach who might feel a bit uncomfortable uh, to help them out and just say, you know, do this, do this and help them out to get them uh, more, uh, more experience. So within your uh, sessions and your session structures, are there any particular areas that you focus on? Um, depends on the, let's just say the game before. So let's, I analyse the game and see what I can uh, work on. So let's just say uh, if we need to work on midfield support, I'll do uh, a session um, a warm up which is related to combination play and then from there I'll build the session um, uh, up and up and up and drive the intensity uh, because I believe as a coach if you have a kind of low intensity then sometimes the players switch off but if you have a high intensity then they can react, uh, react off you really really well even if they're not playing as well they still have that extra 5% to try and give you uh, and then therefore they can help the team a bit more um, every session is planned so if I let's just say the session doesn't go to plan and plan A, I always have a plan B and a plan C and therefore uh, I can adapt quite quickly to make the sessions more fun if it's getting a bit um, I don't want to say boring but sometimes uh, it can go flat you just uh, do a, have a bit of fun and then go back into it and see uh, if they get the ideas sometimes it can go simple, simple being complex and sometimes the uh, complex can be a bit more difficult so for some children so you just have to break it down again and therefore they can uh, you can work on it and then the following week you can do something similar and then the following week it could be something completely different and then maybe a couple of weeks again but just thing, uh, just interact, uh, so interacting with the players again and seeing what the best way for them is You mentioned the Curva sessions Curva um, courses. Now, I went a few years ago, and one of the things that I can I clearly remember was Alf Gullerstein saying, "If you can count it, you can introduce an element of competition, and that will always up the levels of intensity." Is that something that you put in? Because you mentioned there about making things Plan C to make things more fun. Is competition one of the ways that you make things more fun? Uh, yeah. So I think. Um Kids these days they want to compete. You know, maybe FIFA. You know, I mean, they like to have the competition. You know, what I mean, but at the end of the day, the it could be something just a five ten minutes just to uh, get them back into it. Uh, I went to the all the the Cuerva stuff, the diploma one and two, and it was excellent how the they adapted things. But it's all about speed, speed, speed. But sometimes the the players might not get what's happening. Maybe the speed of thought, and it just be a bit, a bit slow. But then, uh, just a wee bit of fun. Just everyone can back in. We'll do something uh, which will take two or three minutes just to get them refreshed and then back in. And I believe the the sometimes you have to drive the intensity as a coach, but sometimes you have to leave it to the players to uh, pick the intensity up. But uh, it's just one of them things. I believe I like um, Conte and I like uh, Klopp how they are passion, but they drive the intensity because they want to to do well for the team and help them get so much better just that extra 1% but that extra 1% could either be a goal or a, a, a saving challenge What have been the biggest influences on your coaching style? So I've, uh, I, like to, I like to go to the, the Inspire guys uh, John and Jed they were really really I started to follow them their stuff and it was really good but the, I started to look at the uh, some of the guys who are on it and I started following them and I like the the mindset stuff you know you're 
I liked the the variety of different um, uh, speakers they had, but the best one it was probably in December of last year, where they had such a variety of speakers from like Prozone to um, uh, different kind of uh, coaches to Alistair McCaw, the guy who does the uh, the standards, and me and him, I've spoken to him a few times over the last couple of months about how to get myself better as a coach, uh, but getting myself better so I could help the my team out with like different standards. And that he was one of the most imp- uh, inspirational guys I've ever kind of met because it was his session is um, talk lasted an hour and it was one hour of just pure brilliance. And the guy was very very good, but it had everyone in his basically back of, in the palm of his hands. But he was very very good because he just knew how to kind of deal with kind of questions too. Uh, I liked the I liked uh, the coaching family how they produce kind of sessions. I also like um, there's such a different uh, variety. I use uh, Twitter, and I, I just I don't I like to I don't steal ideas. I like to just maybe copy a few and then make it my own because I know the Sir Alex Ferguson always said he never uh, he took a se- he took a session and just made it his own all the time. But it's the best way to do things, and uh, therefore you can actually adapt the way you want to coach to the needs of your uh, your team. In, uh, in one of Daniel Coyle's books on talent, um, one of the rules that he suggests for improvement is to steal unashamedly. <laughs> oh, that's um, brilliant. I've read, I've read that book, it's brilliant. <clears throat> the talent code is yeah. oh, it's unbelievable, you know what I mean? But it's, uh, the, the books that people are producing right now are brilliant, from uh, mindset to uh, the talent code uh, to even Alice McCaw's new books, really, really good. But it's... Um, it's all about how you work as a coach, and if you want to steal ideas, it's brilliant because you just make them. You, you can steal ideas to make the your, yourself look good, but then you want the team to look better, and then therefore the kids can buy into what you want to co- uh, coach. Yeah, the one on um, Twitter has been great for session plans being put on there to give people ideas, but there's always got to be the caveat that that session was not designed for your players. Definitely. So, as great as it might look, you probably going to need to change it a bit because it's got to be for your players and you know what your players need, hopefully. Uh, definitely. Because you've got the people who kind of, you could Guardiola sessions and then you've got people try to copy that and it's never going to have the same effect because obviously Guardiola is fantastic at what he does. But you can never have the, you can never co- uh, carbon copy the same session. You just have to make it your own and see if you can. Uh, uh, cha- you have to change it to make it the the, the session flow, but also how the standard of the the players too. You talked about uh, briefly their mindset. I actually mentioned mindset earlier uh, in the intro. Some people may not quite be sure what is meant. I mean, Carol Dweck in her book actually defines it quite well. I'm wondering if you could just explain to people what you understand it to be. So I believe it's um, two things. Uh, you've got your growth mindset, which is you want to learn uh, more, so nothing's going to stop you. you. You just push yourself, push yourself, push yourself to make that your, uh, yourself better, to make everyone else better. But uh, you've got a closed mindset where you might, you just, you give up, and it's you just don't want to do it. So I believe if you have a growth mindset, you're always going to succeed. If you have a closed mindset, you are going to succeed, but you're going to hit a barrier, and then the year four, you have to try and get yourself uh, working with people who are positive. Uh, therefore, because if you work with people who are negative, then you're going to be you're going to get yourself down, uh, and therefore you're not going to be as good as a coach, but also not good as a person, and therefore your standards may drop. So yes, yeah, she talks about growth and fixed mindsets. Um, and for me, when I read it, the biggest thing was actually how people with a growth mindset dealt with setbacks versus how people with a fixed mindset dealt with setbacks. And the fixed people tended to be very protective of their own ego yep. and took things very personally. The example that uh, that she used quite a lot was John McEnroe. I don't think she was a fan, but her basic thing was that 
McEnroe's explosions on court, whether he was looking for other people to blame rather than looking at himself and saying, okay, what do I need to do now? That's happened. Now what can I do to make that better? And I think we've had that with some of our footballers in the past, yeah. looking for other people to blame. Maybe an incident, like the referee never uh, called a foul, but it was a definite foul. You just go on with it. You know what I mean? Like you've got, let's just say it's the last five minutes of the game, and you're one 0 down, and you've the ref uh, had a, let's say, not the best of games. You just say, well, you constitute your own game, and therefore, if you constitute your own game with your team, you might get a goal here. But if you just have that kind of close mindset, where oh, we've got five minutes to go, or we're getting the referee's not helping us, we're not having the best of the games, then you're not going to get that goal. But if you have a, a, a growth mindset, then you will potentially get a goal. And then if you actually get a goal within two or three minutes, you may actually get a winner. And I think there's a lot of things um, like that in football at the moment, like the, the World Cup, uh, sorry, the Euros. Uh, it was all about the you know that last minute goals, and it was brilliant to see. One of the uh, one of the Premier League games last season, I can recall Arsene Wenger once again blaming the referees yeah. for what happened, and it was against Southampton. And Ronald Koeman's response was, "He's blaming the referee, but actually he should look at his team who have had twenty shots and not been able to score any of them." So if you're looking yeah. at growth mindset, it's actually we need to improve our finishing. And then we can't be blaming other people. Definitely. What would you think about um, the growth mindset and accepting that you are, as a player, flawed in some way or as a manager flawed in some way and you have to go and, and improve that versus the contradiction we have in sport where players and managers have to have absolute belief in their own abilities? There's a, those two things. It's like yeah. it's like for, you have to switch one on during the game and then switch it off when it comes to training. Yeah, it's it's very difficult because you could have a, a player who has an unbelievable talent but uh, has a closed mindset versus a, a player who wants to be that uh, player but has a growth mindset and they try and meet in the middle but it will never happen because the the mindset, obviously, everyone's mind's totally different, but it's how you want to work. You know what I mean? And you can have a manager who wants to have the best team, but he has to. The players have to buy into the manager, and therefore, the sorry, just a second. Uh, the players uh, obviously have to buy into the manager's uh, theory and uh, and his kind of mindset. And if he's got a growth mindset, then generally the players will go to him. But if the kind of has any doubt then the players start to feel a bit, you know, not uh, great around the manager, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so if you had a chance to change something within youth development, what would it be? Um, that's a really difficult question, uh, but I think there's, um, I think my, my, uh, football, is, is, uh, there's a lot of money in football at the moment, and it does, there's, too much money in football at the moment, but yeah. I believe that the, the the top has a lot of money when it comes down, let's just say it trickles down to the bottom, there's not a lot of money in there, however you could have a, a youth coach who does a really, really good job, but doesn't get the recognition, you know what I mean, and sometimes, obviously, you've got people, uh, young guys who are 24, 25, 26, might have three jobs, just to try and get them, you know, a, a youth coach, a uh, uh, doing an odd job and an odd job but their passion is football but they still have to pay the bills yeah. but they have to try and maybe you know look at like at grade one academies you know what I mean some of these academies uh, some people are on, on let's say £25,000 over the year you know what I mean or 30000 When in Scotland you know that's a lot of money in England it's not as much but it's still comfortable uh, yeah. for some people but then if you look at the you know the bigger clubs; they'll pay managers four or five million pound over a year, and I think the youth development there has to be a lot. Uh, you have to invest in youth, in my eyes. 
but you have to invest in the managers too. Uh, sorry, mm. coaches, because coaches at the end of the day have to have a an idea of how they're going to survive. But the if the managers are getting paid four or five million pounds, then the players obviously some players are getting paid three hundred thousand pound a week, mm-hmm. which is ludicrous. And, but in the day, it's a job for some of these players. But that's I think that's maybe where I stand with new development. Also, I think the the thing I've seen at the moment, a lot of players are going out, out on loan, you know, into lower league clubs, and it's not great. I see. I just listened to the uh, another podcast with um, Stevie Greve, uh, the, the, the World Football yeah. Index, and it's really interesting stuff. The, the gentleman who presents it, saying that the, one of the boys is going to get signed for Manchester City, but he went to Deportivo La Coruña. Why can't he just play it? You know, Manchester City play the, the the league games. Yeah, oh sorry, the cup games. Play with the like a reserve squad. Therefore, he's in game time. But also, he's integrated with that squad. And I look, um, you know, I've looked at Chelsea. They've probably spent maybe twenty players on loan. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's not a bad thing. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, you, who, who's your club? You know what I mean? You could have. You look at some of the Chelsea players. They've been on loan five or six times over the last five years. Christian Atu has been on loan last. It's just kind of like loan today to Newcastle, I think. It's, I think yeah. the last three seasons, it was a Bournemouth last season, Everton the season before. Yeah, and it's just like why, why, why can't they just play in the kind of cup games or get, integrate them? Because you've got, well, you've got amazing players at Chelsea, Arsenal. But look at them, maybe don't I say the lower league teams, but you know, like yeah, the people are not going to be in the Champions League or the Europa League, but they can mm. still challenge for something. End of the day, they need to bring the youngsters have to try and. Uh, was a good challenge for that spot, but then you can just look at the transfer market right now. I'm going to pay twenty five million pounds for a player, and then that youngster's like, I don't know what to do. And I think there's a lot of, you know, youth academies are brilliant in some of these countries, but they have to try and. The, I think some of the managers are scared that the youth might kind of make a mistake and cost them a game. But then yeah, but then that comes back to your growth mindset. Do mm-hmm. you have the trust to? In your players to do well, and I think that's more uh, to do with kind of <clears throat> development. Kind of them two points. I think the money has brought laziness and fear. Yep. Laz- yep. Laziness in that they don't need to develop players because they can just throw some cash at someone. Yep. And fear, linked to what you just said there, there's a lot of money at stake which means that people's jobs are at stake. So they're not willing to take that chance on the young player unless that young player is already arriving as a finished article, which is a huge thing to ask of a young footballer. Well, definitely, because it's, um, there's so much money, as you said, in football, but they're the, the fear they might, like, let's just say, the, the relegation. You know, obviously there's a lot of money in the Premier League. If you get relegated, you get X amount of money. But you still want to be in the Premier League in the day. But, um, I, you know, I would take a gamble. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you, young people, like Ru- Ruben loves his cheek. He made his, made, made his debut uh, in a Champions League game. And he was brilliant. He pressed the ball, pressed the ball, pressed the ball. It was great to see. That, that was, it was great to see, you know, young players pressing the ball. Also try you know, make a name for himself, and obviously, you get Conte in, I don't know how his plans are for, you know, younger people, but he's kind of seen like he might be uh, doing that kind of thing, but then, end of the day, I'm not the, I'm not, the, I'm not the Chelsea manager, so, <laughs> uh, oh. Alright, so we'll, we'll finish on Ask the Coach, and the question this week's been sent in by Johnny Below. he said, um, is Rangers being back in the top division good for Scottish football? Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a good for Scottish football. Uh, a couple of reasons why the, you've got you've got Hearts, Aberdeen, um, Rangers, Celtic. Uh, they kind of mo- main four kind of uh, getting better. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? Providing that kind of competition. I uh, think I think Rangers and Celtic big old fun. It's great to see it again. Um, I seen the the game at Hamden. It was electric. The, the atmosphere it was great to see because I'm not a Rangers or Celtic fan yeah. but it was great to see from a neutral point of view but um, I think great to see the how the Rangers got on obviously Celtic have started really really well this season with uh, 
you know, the, the good the Scott Sinclair, what a great signing for Celtic he was. Yeah. Uh, but then I like Joey Barton. I think he brings something else to the game. Uh, so I believe there's there is positives and negatives, but I think the the positives outweigh the negatives in this kind of scenario. I think the for Scottish football was great to see Rangers back into the top flight. Yeah, how do you think this will help the game going forward? Is it, is uh, well, I think because uh, I think Celtic have done really, really well to get to the Champions League kind of uh, 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 group stages, but then look at Rangers potentially could win the cup. Yeah. That would be potentially a Europa League spot. spot. Obviously, there's a lot of kind of five or six rounds before that, but then if Rangers go into that, or even Aberdeen or Hearts, you know, or any of the teams in the SPFL, it could promote Scottish football so much more. If you've got a, you know, two teams in Europe, yeah. it would help. You know, obviously publicise a bit more, but also money because obviously there's a lot less money in Scotland. But I believe. That's where the youth, that youth development kind of helps a lot of it. But yeah. uh, I think the, with Rangers, the support they have, you know, and the the, fa- the the fans, I think it's great to see. You know, if it potentially if they could do really really well, then you could have t- we'll have two teams in Europe, hopefully. Therefore, you could have a more of a you know one of the magical nights. You know, what I mean, at Ibrox or mm. at Parkhead or in Pontrodre or. You know, parts or any of these kind of bigger clubs. Yeah. So, um, so before we go, do you want to plug your social media? Yeah, that's, um, my Twitter was a uh, Laurie McGinley one. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's Laurie McGinley one, uh, yeah. and that's me. <laughs> that's, I've really enjoyed speaking to you today. I'd love to have you on again in the future. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Right, cheers, guys.